the apostle, uh, a very learned, learned man, very well educated, was not just a student of Jewish religion, he was a student of philosophy. Paul was probably, in comparison, one of the most intelligent people that ever lived. When God broke him of his rebellion, broke him of his hatred of the early church, he used Paul to spread the church throughout Asia and Asia Minor and, and into Europe. There, there's even some conjecture that Paul, maybe in his missionary journeys, made it as far north as southern Great Britain to the British Isles before he was eventually hauled back to the Roman capital and executed at the, by the sword. See, Paul was a threat to the emperor, a threat to Rome because, not well, not so much because he was challenging Roman rule and Roman authority, but because he was introducing the completion of the Jewish scriptures. And what I mean by that is all of the Old Testament was continuously pointing everyone who could read and understand to see the fulfillment of the prophecies made about the Messiah in Jesus Christ. And so Paul spent his entire earthly ministry writing about and talking about Jesus and explaining to all who would listen and, and even the obstinate, hard-hearted people, explaining to them how Jesus was that fulfillment. And his heart was bent on seeing people not just become Christians, but to, to be converted away from the way they were living. And that meant devoutly religious Jewish folk and also the religious Roman philosophers and the Greek philosophers around the area. See, at the time, it was state law, federal law, if you want to, if you will, or Roman law, that everyone must worship the emperor as God. There were these traveling religious monuments that would roam around a city, and as it passed you, morning, sir, have a good day. As it passed you, morning. As that mini traveling temple passed you, it was Roman law that you had to bow down and offer your obeyance, your worship, to the emperor. And if you refused, you were picked up and carted off and hauled away to a Roman prison for breaking Roman law. And Paul was teaching people to bow to no one other than Jesus Christ. And as I've already said, some of those people that he was teaching that to were his fellow Pharisees and other Jewish believers. And his heart was for the conversion of all people. He eventually sits down and pens a letter to the fledgling church in Rome. And in that letter, he talks to not just the Gentiles the, or the Greeks or, or the Romans. He talks to the Jews. And he eventually comes to what we call Romans chapter 10. And he begins to tell them this. Everyone who would read this or hear it read as a letter was passed around the city of Rome from small congregation to small congregation and then eventually out into Asia and Asia Minor and other places as it was copied and passed along. He was communicating a very specific message and here in chapter 10 starting in verse 5 here's what he says. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that would be the law of God, the Ten Commandments, the eternal moral law of God, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. 
But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction, listen to what Paul says, between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But out of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to disobedient and a contrary people. Paul's heart was not just for his fellow Jews. And when he speaks of the Greek in this passage. He's not just talking about a bunch of people who lived on an island just off the coast or the southern tip of Europe. Greeks meant everyone who was not Jewish at that time, the Gentile people. And he was actually bringing a bit of harsher judgment on the Jewish people because the Greeks, the Gentiles, were believing in Christ who they had not been taught about for their entire lives as the Jewish people had. But still, Paul's heart is to see people saved. And that's why he commends in this letter to the church in Rome, not the Roman Catholic Church, not the Vatican City that is there now, but the fledgling church, the church made up of small little congregations dotted across the landscape of the seven hills of Rome. What Paul was telling people there was the gospel has come and it will be preached. It will be good news to you. And when you reject it, it's not because you're too smart. It's because you love your sin. And that is a hard message for many people. It was hard for me for a very long time. So the message of Paul was a message of God from as early as the book of Genesis where he promised Adam and Eve shortly after their fall into sin that he would send the Messiah through them. That he would send the Messiah through the bloodline of Adam. So that as the sin curse passed on to all of Adam's descendants, all of us, it would also, the bloodline of Adam would bring about the birth of the Messiah. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, would come through Adam, and then through Abraham, and then on from Abraham's descendants to David, and from David's descendants on into the New Testament times where we see the Bible, the scriptures describe the birth of Christ. And then we see the scriptures describe his life and his preaching and his teaching. And we see the scriptures also describe 
the trials and the judgment that were that was placed on him by human beings and we see his crucifixion and his death and his burial and his resurrection and eventually his ascension into heaven where he now sits in his rightful place. See, Paul knew all of those things and he watched as his fellow Jewish people rejected all of the fulfillment of the prophecies that pointed to Christ. And he also watched as the Gentile people, the people from outside of Jerusalem, the people outside of Israel, came in droves to Christ, having never heard of him prior to the preaching of Paul and the other apostles. Paul's heart was for the conversion of sinners. Not to build numbers, not to build an earthly church, some mass conglomeration of authority and hierarchy, to rule over and lord over people and to establish a new set of religious practices and religious self-righteousness. Paul's heart was for people to worship Christ in spirit and in truth. And that's why he preached the gospel. And it was his practice. And this is listed in several places. It was Paul's practice as he entered into a city to go about and find first the synagogues, the Jewish gathering places and to teach them about Christ and then when they turned their backs on him or rejected him or drove him out he would then go to the gathering places wherever people were no matter how large the crowds or how small the crowds whether it was one or one thousand Paul would go and he would bring the gospel and as the scriptures say how beautiful are the feet that bring good news So there again, as I have said before, if you are within earshot of this and you have never come to Christ in repentance and faith, if you've never understood how the love of God compelled Him to send His Son to absorb His wrath while on the cross, to live a perfectly righteous life, a life that none of us could live, and then die and be buried, if you've never taken the time to dwell on that, do so today. Think about what you believe. Think about where you are and do not trust in being educated. Don't trust in being a church member. Don't trust in your own ideas of how you worship. Trust only in Christ. He is the only way that anyone can enter into heaven. Jesus himself said there is no name given unto men by which are given into heaven by which men can be saved but the name of Christ. No one comes to the Father but through me is what Jesus said. If that does not describe you, my prayerful request to you today is to Change, change that while you still have time. Every day we are reminded of how short life is. Just this in the last week, a young man in Colorado went to school three days away from his graduation and two deplorably despicable evil teenagers like him walked into the school where he was with guns ready to mow down as many people as possible and this young man instead stood up with two others and rushed the shooters and he gave up his life in that moment 
to save others. We do not know when our lives are going to be called into account. In just the last week and a half, four law enforcement officers across the United States went to their jobs, entered their work world at the beginning of their day thinking it was just another day and in one case a man who was near retirement was shot to death in an ambush by someone for no other reason than but putting on the uniform and starting his shift that day. We do not know that we have tomorrow. We do not know when God is going to call us into account for our sin. But he is patient, and he is long-suffering, and he is forbearing in ways that we cannot understand. And he will forgive if you turn to him through Christ. The command of Scripture is turn to Christ and live. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. There is no other name given under heaven by which you can be saved. There is no way to the Father but through the Son. Christ is salvation. The Lord Jesus Christ, as I have read in this book or in this passage from Romans, confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart. And this isn't just uh, an amorphous, feel-good, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. This is the, the heart, believing in the heart. As Paul wrote this, for the people of the time, the heart was the center of thought. It wasn't just emotion, it was thought. Paul wanted you to be intellectually convinced that God was real, that Christ was his son, that he was God in the flesh, God incarnate, and that he had paid that penalty for you that you, you yourself cannot pay. And he said, confess that with your mouth. The Greek word confess is homo logeo. It means to say the same thing. He was, he was telling his audience, he was telling his readers, read the scriptures, he said. Listen to my words, he was saying. Confess what I say about you. Confess what I say about myself. And then intellectually give assent to it. Emotionally give assent to it. Oh, I don't preach to have a crowd, young ma'am. Whoever can hear wherever they're at. What was that? I'm not here for people who have already passed, ma'am. I'm here for people who are maybe waiting to hear and believe. Who has the mark of the beast, ma'am? Do you even know what the mark of the beast is? So what is it? Share, share with me. Okay. Have a good day, ma'am. See, I'm often faced with people who think they know who's going to hell and who's not going to hell. Oh, ma'am, I do. I don't know why the message upsets you. What am I doing that's wrong? This is how Christ behaved, ma'am. It's not about who's listening, it's if even one person hears. I, I couldn't hear you over the tractor. So no one has a, so no one has a chance of going to heaven, ma'am? So no one, al no one alive today can turn to Christ and live? That's, that's not even biblical, ma'am. 
You can't find that in the scriptures anywhere. Ma'am, I know... I. No, ma'am, I don't... No, no ma'am, I don't think you do. No, ma'am. You're very angry at the message of the gospel, and that breaks my heart. Ma'am, plenty of people have heard me already today. See, I, I run into that a lot. People who profess to be Bible experts. People, people who, who think they know or they think there needs to be a crowd. I'm not out here for a crowd. I'm not out here for self-congratulations. No, literally, I have been mocked. I've been threatened. I've also had some very good conversations out here with people. And you know, the people that most often are most angry at what I'm doing while I'm out here are other people who claim to be Christian. Very few of the people who get the angriest at me are atheists. Actually, most of the people who are most pleasant out here are the atheists or the agnostics. The people who get the angriest are what I refer to as professing Christians in Western Christian culture. And I'm going to be quite frank with you right now, and if you hear this and it upsets you, I'm sorry, I'm not sorry. Most people who profess to be Christian in Southeast Minnesota are self-righteous tarts. They think because they've gone to the right church their whole lives, they've been to the Roman Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, the Missouri Senate, the ELCA, the United Methodist, the Free Methodist, Independent Baptist, Fundamental Baptist, Bible-believing Baptist, Bible Church, the ELCA, whatever the case might be, those are the people that get the angriest and the atheists come up and go, tell me more. And most of the time the atheists want to convince me why I'm a, a raving idiot. And I'm okay with that. I'd rather have a conversation with an atheist who thinks I'm a raving idiot than to have a professing Christian who is just a cultural Christian tell me that I'm doing it wrong. And then when I ask them, what do you do? When they tell, when they ask me what I, or when I ask them what I'm doing wrong, they tell me, well, that's not how I would do it. And then I ask them, well, how do you do it? And they say, well, I don't do it at all. And I would rather be wrong in the way I do it than not do it at all. And I would rather marginal cultural Christians be angry at me and have decent conversations with an atheist than to have somebody who says they love God and love Christ but never have the tenacity or the intestinal fortitude to tell other people what they need to do to be saved or to tell me go where the crowds are What kind of selfishness is that? If you're a Christian, you'll only talk to people in a crowd, but you won't talk to people. Even the scripture, Christ himself tells us, go into the whole world and preach the gospel to all creatures. If you're a Christian and you're not preaching the gospel, you're in worse sin than an atheist. Do your co-workers know you're a Christian? Does your neighbor know you're a Christian? If your co-workers and your neighbors don't know that you're a Christian because you never talk about your Christ, about your God, about your Savior, you might as well drop the cliches, drop the facade, and just stop pretending to be a believer. I'm not out here for 5,000 people. I'm out here if even one person hears and is challenged and thinks I can't convince anyone I don't have the power I don't have the time to change a hard heart or a hard hardened mind I am out here because as strange as this is going to sound to you I love the image bearers of God and if you are a human being, you are an image bearer, and I love you, and my desire for you is to turn to Christ and live. That's it. Repent and believe the gospel. Jesus' first words, repent and believe. So if you know someone who says they're a Christian and they have never shared the gospel with you, 
challenge them. Ask them why you should believe that they're a Christian. And as a young man I met out here last summer told me Christians are the hardest people on him. God have mercy on you if you're a Christian and you mock people. May God have mercy on you if you're a Christian and you mock people and then you've never told them about the one you claim is your Savior. Morning, ma'am. Have a good run. The most humble people in the world should be Christians because we have the most to be humbled about. See, the thing is that most Christians think that their salvation is something that they've done, they've worked up in themselves, and that somehow they've brought God's pleasure on them because they've been relatively good people. And see, the terrifying thing about that is, is God says, look, I don't save you because you're good. I save you because I, I sent my son to die in your place. And then he tells us to go out and tell other people. A wise man once said that a Christian telling other people about Jesus is like a blind man showing another blind man to where to find food. So my desire is that you would hear the message, not something I've written, but something that the Bible says you need Christ. Without Christ, you have no hope. Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. It is only through Him.